Well, welcome everybody. I am Jeffrey Richardson, uh, Director of Product Marketing here at Cochaba, and uh, excited to have you here today for this Cochaba webinar event. We are going to be unpacking all things WWDC from the event last week, and uh, really excited to unpack a lot of the details uh, on a number of topics. Obviously, we can't cover it all, uh, but have a really awesome panelist lineup here today from the team to help us wade through some, some very detailed topics. So um, welcome. And uh, first off, before we jump into the discussion, I want to go through a couple of quick announcements. Um, so first, uh, this webinar, uh, we love your interaction. We love questions. So please submit questions through the Q&A option in the window that you have. We'll have a dedicated time at the end for question and answer. Uh, but if questions come in throughout, I will certainly pepper them in through the conversation. Uh, another one. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand. So don't worry about trying to take a bunch of screenshots or, or notes. You'll be able to consume it on demand after the fact. And then uh, lastly, uh, continue the discussion with us. Follow us online on uh, social. We are on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, those are the handles. So connect with us. Additionally, today, um, for all attendees, we are going to have a random drawing after the webinar. Uh, where one of you lucky attendees will win these Beats by Dr. Dre headphones. So um, we will reach out to you by email after the event. Uh, so be, be sure to watch out for an email from Cochaba Marketing um, if you're the lucky person, but make sure not to miss it. Check the, check the trash or the junk box uh, potentially too in case we get caught in there. Now I'd like to bring on our panelists who will be uh, helping to unpack uh, some of these WWDC talking points today. So um, Ethan, would you like to give your introduction first? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, super, super excited to be talking with everyone today. Um, my name is Ethan Lewis. I'm the CTO at Coachava. Uh, you know, like I said, um, June's always a, a really fun time. WWDC coming out every year. A lot of announcements, a lot of really subtle things this year that they announced and thrilled to be talking to everyone. Yeah, thanks, Ethan. And, and Mark? everyone uh good morning afternoon and or evening uh from wherever you're consuming the content yeah thank you for joining us uh always exciting to see what apple has in store for us annually so uh, happy to unpack some of those details with you all answer some questions uh, and kind of set the stage for what uh the beta could bring and uh what the general release in the fall could look like so um thanks for thanks for having us jeff yeah yeah um well real quick i want to uh, have our um, admin, Sierra Scott, who's running some stuff in the background, uh, launch a poll so we can kind of gauge from the audience how many of you have already consumed WWDC session content. So take a moment and uh, respond to that. While we're doing that, Ethan, Mark, I kind of both want to ask you, um, the Vision Pro, if you were to get one, what's what's the first thing that you would do with that Vision Pro? I myself think I would probably watch Avatar 2 on Disney Plus, um, considering they'll be ready on day one. Um, but that's just me. So Ethan, what would you do? Yeah, uh, in a past life, I was very deep uh, in, in AR and VR. So the announcement of Vision Pro was something that I was super excited to see and excited to, to see how it changes specifically the marketing landscape. Um, you know, for me, it's probably a toss up on a uh, book, a really long flight and zone out <laughs> with the Vision Pro or um, another area that I'm super interested in is, uh, you know, I dabble in FPV drones and uh, as just a side hobby. And I think it could be really cool to see if there's a crossover between some of the goggle technology that you see today, as well as these VR headsets. Certainly with the design, it, you know, that's right where my head went was, looks just like my FPV drone setup, which is cool. Yeah, might be able to simulate a, like a, skydiving or something like that you never know right um and mark yeah i think the first thing that i would do uh with a pair um i was i was chatting with uh taylor morris from digital turbine about this and uh we decided the first thing that we would do is uh use an app like onyx map uh shout out to a great coach of a customer mind you uh to explore outdoor areas whether it's uh hunting or fishing or uh, mountain biking, hiking, uh, anything being outside, uh, these these goggles, glasses uh, could be a great way for you to explore the area before you get out there, to prep for the kind of terrain you're going to see, 
and just ultimately uh, gather some information that will result in better, pre uh, better preparation and higher chances of success for whatever activity that you're doing. So um, pretty awesome to see the uh, app developer uh, progress in that sector. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm excited. I don't know if I can afford one um, yet, but it maybe I don't know. Maybe one of you will will get it for me as a gift. Um, no, the thirty four thirty four ninety nine. I think is the starting price. <laughs> right. I'll start saving up. Um, let's see. So I'm displaying the poll results here. Um, so it looks like about twenty two percent have not watched any of the content. And 70% have watched some, it was 9% most, and nobody's watched it all. I don't even know if, I don't know if I've watched it all. There's a lot of content cons to consume. So um, that's good to know as we go into the discussion, just you know, as we think about the level of detail on some of the topics we're covering. Um, so thanks for participating in that poll. So let's dive in because we got a lot to cover. Um, privacy is going to be certainly a big topic of our discussion today, probably take a bulk of the time. I know from just the registrations and the comments we got through that process, that was the topic that most folks were interested in. Scan, obviously there's been some updates there and it directly correlates to privacy. Uh, we'll touch on the Vision Pro again and, and some of what that might mean for AR and metaverse and all sorts of applications. And then your questions uh, from the audience. So we have a couple from registration we'll, we'll put in the mix, but again, Use that Q and A option to ask a question at any moment, at any moment, and uh, we'll, we'll try and get to as many of those as we can. So, on the topic of privacy, this is a list of, of not exhaustive, but of just some of the um, items that had updates or details that came out or are brand new from WWDC 2023. Um, I won't read through all of them. We will definitely be talking about privacy manifests as a big topic in and of itself. Um, but Ethan and Mark, I kind of want to. Um, ask you just in terms of the consumer facing end of all ends of everything privacy on Apple, um, if you can talk a little bit about just the privacy nutrition labels as how this all rolls up to the end consumer and gives them, you know, the transparency that I think Apple's trying to provide. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you hit on it. You know, this is largely your opportunity as an app developer to showcase the, the types of data that you're collecting, the use cases that you have within your app, making sure that, that the, those use cases are justified and they help improve the user experience of your app. And in certain areas where it's business driving, clearly articulating that to the end user. So um, while there wasn't a lot of changes with privacy nutrition labels with this round of WWDC, I know we'll hit on some other ones moving you know, somewhat forward, but what I'm really excited about is this is a pretty manual process to generate uh, today for developers having gone through some of that um, ourselves with with the apps that we were uh, you know pushing out and any streamlining that can take place for the developer experience to make sure that this isn't just an afterthought to hit a checkbox going into the store but it's an upfront thing that they're thinking about is a, a big plus for me so excited to see some of the changes there yeah and I would just add from a product perspective that our goal uh, with the nutrition labels is largely to make sure that we facilitate a seamless um, application process to the store. So there's consistency amongst app developers for the functions that Coachella SDK performs. So taking the guesswork out, making sure your app is, uh, it's cleared submission the first time as it relates to our presence client side. Um, so that's that's really our goal um, from, a, from a Coachella product perspective on this one. Yeah, and it seems like the privacy report and, uh, you know, is this a brand new report for Xcode 15? Because that's kind of what I took away from it. I'm not an app developer, so this is a bit above my head uh, on, on certain points. But is this is this what's meant to enable app developers to more seamlessly provide the data that goes into the nutrition labels? That's correct. Yep. And you, you hit it right on the head. This is largely, you know, they, they teased out being able to aggregate some of the data from the privacy manifest that we'll cover in a minute. But this is really a mechanism where developers now, instead of manually going through and creating these labels and uploading them on app submission, can run this directly through Xcode, get a report to attach to the app when they're uploading. Um, and that's the part that I think is, is really uh, you know, nice to see from a developer standpoint on the streamlining process going into the app store. Yeah. And, and, and to clarify the privacy report, because I think this was something in, in you and I talked at one point, I had thought somehow that was almost generating the privacy manifest for the sure. app 
as well for the app developer separate from third-party SDKs, but it sounds like there's still the process of them creating their own privacy manifest too. That's correct. Yep. This is largely just looking at what's been described by the application into the various data collection uh, categories, and then the reasons behind that data use. Um, so just streamlining that process to create that nutrition label that can be uploaded. There, there is still some legwork from the developer as well as third-party SDK developers to create privacy manifests, understanding what domains are being tracked. We'll talk a little bit more, I'm sure, in the future about uh, you know multiple domain strategies that could be coming out through some of these changes. But um, there is still some legwork on the, the developer side to ensure that that data is getting picked up by the privacy report. Okay. And privacy manifests, um, we'll probably spend quite a bit of time on this topic. Um, I've, I've tried to consume a lot myself and, and read up on it. Um, brand new for WWDC 2023 as well and iOS 17. Um, can you can you both take some time and just unpack? Uh, we have some other slides later about kind of what it means for marketers that we'll jump into, mm -hmm. but just start to unpack like privacy manifests. What is it? What does it mean? Yeah, I, I'll jump in first, Mark, feel free to add in anything that uh, that you want. But I think um, the the high level summary for me is, um, you know, this is really the the mechanism that we see Apple pushing out to enforce ATT opt outs. And I, I think that's something that's really, really positive to see. Um, you know, there's so much just interpretation on what's allowed and what's not allowed through some of the terminology that Apple has pushed out. But this makes it really, really black and white on what categories you're falling into and what happens with data on device when the user has opted out. Um, so, you know, whether or not you're you're doing non-tracking uh, and just doing normal user collection for your first party audience, or you're using it for an advertiser use case, being able to really narrow down where data is being transmitted off device is really what privacy manifests are about. And, like I said, I think how that relates to ATT and the ATT opt-out and enforcement from Apple is really, really cool to see. Yeah, agreed. And I also, um, just in addition to that, uh, one of the uh, intended, I would imagine intended consequences of that is a uh, increased adoption of the SCAD network framework. Um, at the moment, there hasn't been a compelling reason to invest in it as heavily uh, because there are um, Hate to use the term workarounds, but there are other options being employed by uh, parts of the ecosystem. Um, and uh, because that has been in place, there has not been that, uh, that uh, catalyst to it really invest heavily in SCAD network. Some networks have, uh, we have some great partnerships uh, with uh, TikTok, with Iron Source, with Snapchat, with Liftoff, who have all invested heavily in SCAD network, and have, we have worked with them to do so. Uh, and I think with the uh, absence of this um, this mechanism and the increase enforcement here through the privacy manifest um, that we'll see a higher adoption of SCAD, we'll see new networks integrating who haven't historically integrated, uh, we'll see continued uh, evolution of the uh, of the optimization framework that the supply side puts in place, uh, and obviously our tools will go to evolve along as well. Um, with Apple's introduction, uh, we'll touch on it later in the slide, but with their introduction of re-engagement, they're continuing to invest in SCAD. And it's a signal that uh, like everything is marching towards uh, SCAD being the mechanism when consent, uh, sorry, not when consent, but regardless of consent. It's a totally augmented and measurement framework. So um, I'm excited to see that too, because we have invested in it heavily and uh, are excited to see that usage increase. Yeah, that's a great point. I was talking here. Yeah, I mute, I mute myself to get the crosstalk, and sometimes I forget to unmute again. Um, so if I think about the the definitions of ATT as well, in terms of what they have been, um, ha have we seen at all a uh, redefining of any of the kind of key principles within the app tracking transparency frameworks definition of tracking? No, that that was one thing that Apple, you know, in my opinion, really made clear this year was that. Uh, their stance hasn't changed on what tracking definitions are. They referenced a lot of the materials that came out in WWDC 2022 and even 2021. And I think, you know, 
showing how they can iterate over these practices and continue to add clarity and around enforcement and how users are being protected is kind of what this year was really about from their their announcements. So while you know I don't think the definition of tracking has changed, the mechanisms uh, of enforcement have. And you know we're seeing that with privacy manifest. We're seeing that with some of the things that came out around uh, privacy SDK. Um, and what they're going to be showcasing as far as a, a bad actor space, as well as some of the changes on Safari around URL parameter uh, extraction. Yeah. And, and timing, just, a, you know, the when question, um, I, th I think from, from consuming some of the video content, it seemed to me they were saying that starting in this fall, they'll do some almost proactive, preemptive outreach to start communicating with app developers, um, third-party SDKs, but then come spring of 24, um, I got the sense that privacy manifests would be required as well as SDK signatures, which I'm sure we'll get to. Um, yep. it's, it's not an honor kind of opt-in system. It's like come spring 2024, it's required and expected, correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, a, a part of the uh, the benefit of seeing things like the automatic reporting from um, the the privacy report, that's all of them showing how they want to leverage privacy manifest for app submission. So whether or not uh, you're you're leveraging all the tools to create your privacy manifest, there's some really interesting things that they announced again more on the developer tooling side around uh, identifying domains for some of the SDKs if if those are popping up that are not described in a privacy manifest, and it and I think all of that tooling that they're investing in, you will see become a requirement on app submission. And it'll be really interesting to, you know, to see uh, how they go through their new, um, you know, their new process and uh, identify when, you know, domains are showing up that are not described in privacy manifest and what that enforcement looks like. Yeah, agreed. And I, the way that I'm thinking about uh, this initial period that you mentioned, Jeff, prior to Spring 2024, when it's obligatory uh, as a part of the app submission, is it's almost like they're using this initial rollout as a as a crowdsourcing of the developers who are uh, a willing to participate and uh, b use that participation to crowdsource a list of tracking domains uh, and the functions of those domains. Yeah, and and that kind of rolls nicely into a question that came in um, anonymously, but um, I don't think we you know. A caveat to this whole discussion, right, is that WWDC always has a ton of content. There's lots of session videos. Sometimes, the, you know, the devil's in the details, and those details aren't available um, immediately post-event. And sometimes it takes weeks or months before developer documentation is fine-tuned. And so, um, I guess take take all this with that in mind. Um, but so the question was, uh, what fields will the privacy manifests prevent collection of if a user doesn't opt in? Uh, for example, fields commonly used to create a user agent um, as one um, particular example. Yeah, so there, uh, there still is some developer documentation that needs finalized. They gave a teaser of a, of, a, of a snippet of the available fields around domains that need to be described when it's related specifically to ad tracking. And then outside of that, you can even see in this picture um, how they go into things like the various uh, user level tracking or device level tracking. And, you know, from our interpretation of it, a lot of that is going through and describing a parameter dictionary and the values that you're going to be collecting as it relates to those specific categories of, of description. So, yeah. you know, what granularity is, is in that, um, I think still a little TBD and they have a lot of really good documentation around the classification of these data categories. Again, that's that's something that they pushed out last year, um, but you know certainly going to be interested again to see if you are having an SDK collect things like user agent. Does that need to be described within your privacy manifest, or does that fall under ad tracking? And if ATT is opted out, the domain that would have received user agent or something like that would have been blocked. Obviously, user agents used for for many many purposes, but. Um, yeah. Certainly interesting to think about. Yeah, the other the other component that I'll layer into that question and answer would be uh, the recent changes to the Chrome um, user agent uh, that now have to be accessed through a Hints API versus uh, access directly from the header of the request. So we have seen some recent changes to user agent, and I uh, I I think we should probably be expecting more. 
Um, so mm -hmm. I would have that expectation. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I jumped to this next slide because it kind of goes hand in hand with that notion of like, there's, I, I guess it's um, the data point in conjunction with the data collection purpose, right? That'll determine right. whether you get it or not. So um, there could be some domains that get it for analytics purposes, but not tracking. And so it's okay for that, but it would block for others when ATT is zero. Um, do you, do you want to unpack um, the different collection purposes that Apple has at the moment? Obviously, I think they're soliciting feedback, right, for potential other, like, collection purposes. So this list may grow over time. Um, but we get to just unpack this. And if we think about Kochava and its position and other types of tooling, where we might fall in some of these bucket categories. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, from my perspective, reading through the descriptions of, of each one of these collections, um, you know, MMPs have a lot of various use cases. It's not uh, it's not something that can just be lumped into third party advertising um, or developer advertising and marketing. Um, we have a lot of analytics capabilities. We have a lot of personalization capabilities, as well as just assisting with app functionality from time to time with what we, what we provide. So, you know, that's not uncommon with a lot of third party SDKs. I think you're going to see a lot of SDKs span a lot of the different data uh, collection categories. And one thing that I'm really interested to see from a trend standpoint is what that means from the privacy manifest and what SDK developers have to do to fully separate out domains to fall within those specific collection categories. Whether or not that becomes a multiple SDK strategy or simply just a multi-domain there's a lot of you know unknowns that we'll have to start parsing through with that as we we roll out. But um, again, a lot of these data collection purposes haven't changed. I hope they get more granular over time. I think that broad categories are a little too broad, and you know definitely would love to see the other use cases get built out on top of this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That those are broad categories for sure. And if you um, look above in the specific. Uh, Apple documentation for describing data use and privacy manifests. Uh, they do elaborate on very specific data types, but not how each of those data types fall within these categories. So uh, this is definitely one of those keep an eye on an evolving uh, document for clarity of um, manifest declaration. Yeah. And just uh, something that I've been thinking about is, you know, owned media has been um, something that we've we've championed with our customers we've seen customers focus in on that in their ios media mix um and you can say a more limited array of partners since you know ios 14.5 and all the changes and but um the tracking definition of att not 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 changing right apple still kept that where it's at and this notion of you know tracking being when you are comparing you know data from your own apps or company websites, right, to that of another company app or web data versus like owned media where it's, hey, I'm, I'm actually doing cross promotional ads within my own portfolio of apps to do cross promotional acquisition, or I'm, you know, doing email or driving folks to my website and then converting them from web to app. Um, it seems like that second row here developers advertising or marketing is kind of like what we think of as owned media and that'll still be in essence separated from the notion of third party advertising and there will still be an ability to measure that i hope even when HD might be zero because it's not technically tracking it but is that a misinterpretation on my part you, you know i think it's a it's a really close one that we're going to have to pay attention to um my read on a lot of the the gray area is that first party uh you know, cross app is something that Apple is keen to prevent, not necessarily the ability for that data to leave the device and, you know, potentially do some uh, cross targeting, but just not cross tracking um, on the same device. We'll see whether or not that, you know, that expands. I'm really interested again to know um, when we look at privacy manifest in the various categories, there's not a breakdown there between a lot of third party uh, or th you know, third-party advertisement versus owned media or first-party measurement um, for for advertising purposes. It just lumps under the term tracking um, and you know tracking domains. And you know, my my naive opinion right now would be that we will see a a little bit of a pullback in the ability to do owned media tracking because of the broad definition of tracking domains. Yeah. 
and I wonder, I know we haven't seen a ton of it, but um, the notion of measuring owned media on scan as a FCC more of in the future. I don't know that many folks are doing that today just because it's like, well, why, why do it if you're going to lose signal? Uh, sure. Well, anything else on, we have a question I'd like to, uh, to pop up. Is there anything, any other one of these categories we specifically want to unpack, or maybe it's just futile because this list is probably going to, going to grow and change. No, I, I think like Mark said, um, it's just something to really pay attention to. And specifically when looking at the Apple documentation, how the various data points fall with each one of these categories, hopefully we'll get more clarity on that over time. Um, and then if you're not already really using this as a, as a starting point on identifying the areas that your apps are collecting data, even as a, a first stab to get a back of the napkin, what categories you fall into. Yeah. And from a developer perspective, the other recommendation I would make is if you're dabbling in any of these categories, but not really invested, you should really think about what you want to invest in heavily and uh, either uh, go all in or stay out of the water in that particular category. Um, so uh, yeah, all in or all out, not a toe. So let's see a question. Um, has Apple provided any new mechanisms for prior audience suppression or re-engagement? Um, and they asked a follow-up for the above question. How do I keep from buying media against already converted customers on iOS? So some yeah, great can, questions. <laughs> Either one of you want to take that? Yeah, I can take a first stab at that one. Uh, mm -hmm. Mind you, it will be mostly Nostradamus, but uh, I see a theme between the two operating systems uh, about um, limiting egress of information from the device in general. Uh, and when it does egress from the device, it goes to the operating system for uh, availability for aggregation or access in, a, in an operating system defined privacy capacity. So when Google introduced their privacy preserving APIs uh, and uh, particularly um, Fledge, which is now called the protected audience API, I call it Poppy. I don't think they like it, but uh, <laughs> when Google released Poppy, they uh, made the, that uh, that ability available it was not initially it was not initially released the suppression aspect specifically uh and so with developer feedback we went to them our common clients went to them and said hey i i understand that the protected audience api facilitates targeting but how do, how will it treat suppression uh so they had not had that in the initial builds they have since added it uh onto the roadmap and i i see apple taking a similar approach to this uh mm -hmm. with regard to um targeting or uh, suppression list for their devices in the absence of deterministic uh, addressability. So Ethan, I don't know if you have any thoughts there, but I, I see the two kind of going in a similar direction. Absolutely. I, I think you're spot on and I would agree with, with everything you said. I, I think that what will, will be really interesting to see is um, how much of these technologies are on device to prevent further exposure of ads that they have seen. And that's something you know, obviously the, the, the platforms keep very close to their chest. We don't get full insight into that, but, um, you know, feedback going back to Apple and Google, at least from our end, is that suppression is something that's very important and that they need to be thinking about as we start to roll off these, uh, you know, more deterministic methods of suppression. Yeah, good question. It, it translates all the way to frequency. How do you know when to stop serving the ad if you don't know how to direct that traffic well and we'll, we'll get to scan too here in a moment but you know the addition of re-engagement being the big takeaway for scan five um i know that's a question that's popped up in a number of places is well, that's great but how do we target um sure. so i guess let's let's go through we have another question i'll, I'll uh, it kind of fits right into um some of the unpacking of like what we've just covered obviously privacy manifests and the whole topic are there's a ton more documentation out there. We just don't have the time to unpack it all. But if we step back now and just say, like, what does all this mean for marketers as like the, the TLDR takeaways? Um, can you unpack some of the uh, signal loss elements uh, in terms of what we're going to see out of privacy manifest, as well as other like the privacy pillars session was interesting for some of the stuff that will happen on Safari. So Ethan or Mark, uh, would love you to jump in on that. 
yeah, I, I think the the TLDR for me is that um, ATT enforcement is is something that is here. It it wasn't. It was up for um, you know implementers to decide how to uh, interpret some of the gray area when users were ATT opt out. Um, and you know, data transmission was uh, was not something that was being blocked. Uh, just the access to you know more probabilistic or fingerprinting means as a as a call out with the new additions of privacy manifest and some of the things that are even on this screen around um, automatically blocking tracking URLs or uh, removing ID fields click ID fields out of URL parameters. Um, that signal truly will not be coming through in the same means that it is today. You know, we were really going to have to be paying attention to what anonymous signal, even from an app usage looks like when users are opting out of ATT. Um, and that's something that, you know, we're, we're really keen to, to think about it. I don't know um, how much we'll spend on the, uh, the network relays, but just another trend I think uh, showcasing how Apple is really pushing developers to explore um, the methodologies on how they implemented things like private relay and how as a, you know, a backend service provider, but also as an app developer, you can tie into things like these network extensions to, uh, you know, get similar characteristics on securing things like IP address um, coming from the app itself. So, you know, more mechanisms on enforcement of, uh, of consent and opt-in is the TLDR for me. Yeah. Yeah, the, the main point that I would add um, to what Ethan said, which is totally agree with, uh, Coachella has been investing in uh, tools to help with uh, aggregated or campaign-based performance um, that's less deterministic, uh, that's less real-time, but has a lot of fidelity and has a lot of value. So. Uh, in the spring, a couple months ago, we announced a purchase of machine advertising with um, a piece of technology called Always On Incremental Measurement that uses uh, campaign cohort-based measurement uh, as opposed to device-based measurement. So uh, the plan ultimately uh, is to uh, help provide insight using a lot of the backwards-facing collection of performance uh, to um, have a, a, a high level of confidence and predictability of a performance for a campaign based on known behavior in the past for that particular campaign or cohort or region. So um, our heads are definitely wrapped around uh, the same concepts that we're seeing here. Uh, we don't see it as signal loss. We just see it as uh, transitioning to a different kind of signal. Yep, yeah. absolutely. And I think that's a, a really good call out to bring up some of the other mechanisms to start leaning on outside of even things like SKAD network um, being able to standardize around campaign names, integrating with cost providers, looking at how you can start to do incremental measurement holistically across your signal for campaign optimization um, are, are still things that are very relevant. Yeah, and I think we're, it's not a launch, but it'll be a relaunch, uh, I think next week um, for that. So I'm definitely excited for that. It's a, you know, think of as, as we look to future and future proofing and uh, cohorted based versus one to one type measurement, which is it's got a shelf life. Um, yep, absolutely. There, there's a question here uh, from Michael, um, and I, I don't know that we know this yet because you know level of detail here again still still pending. But for the query string parameter stripping, do we know if this applies to all links in mail and messages or just uh, user to user shared mail? So I don't know if I don't know if either of you know more about that. Yeah, they they did not really answer that specific question, but one thing that that's worth calling out that's somewhat related is um, they specifically call out that the the domain or the, the click ID parameters and some of the URL blocking and tracking domains that are blocking are not going to be blocked when the user engages specifically with it. So I would take that somewhat to uh, to mean that we will likely see some user to user share capabilities for IDs to be uh, remaining, maybe even as far as something like referral IDs being available through uh, some of the clicking um, or engagement from users. But you know that that's the only call out that I would say the documentation has is when the user actually is interacting, um, they don't plan on stripping out those those IDs directly but they do plan on uh, 
other means of pulling those out for you know anything email safari based interesting yeah i don't i don't know that i would have a lot of value to add to what ethan just said but i will say that i uh, have seen a lot of commentary in market about significant impacts to uh, ESPs, uh, to uh, push providers, and to Google Tag Manager, quite frankly. Right. Um, so we'll see the extent of those impacts, but I've definitely been hearing uh, that as well. Yeah. Um, Mark, just the audio, I think, is from your mic seems really choppy. I don't know are you, if you're on uh, the earphones, maybe battery's low or something like that. I don't know if you have the ability to switch your mic source. It's gotten a little choppier throughout the. Um, Ethan, another question here. Mm -hmm. So this is from Neil. So what does this mean for redirect traffic? And also ask the question, um, roughly what percentage of traffic incoming to Kochava is redirect? I don't know if we, I don't know if you know that off the top of your head, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't have the the answer off the top of my head. Certainly, something that we can we can pull and share. Um, but uh, you know, for for redirect traffic, it's a little unclear. I think that um, as you know, a lot of our redirects are coming through our based off campaign or, or you know other media sources that are not directly tied to an ID or an identifier within the URL. So I don't expect to have a massive impact on those clicks that are coming through specifically as it relates to getting to a final destination. There's been no hint at that um, from uh, you know, Apple or some of the announcements that that functionality would start to get blocked. What specifically will be blocked though, is if you're starting to attach identifiers that would look something like cross-site tracking or cross-property tracking, those are the main targets that would be stripped out. So, you know, that uh, an example of a click identifier would be publisher manufactures a click ID, uh, attaches it to a, a click redirect. Right when that takes place, click ID is stripped away. We land on the redirect page. Um, you know, we're not using click ID to, to look up a, a redirect URL. We would look up the redirect URL based on other parameters within the query and further redirect the user on. The reason why that's a big call out is if users are using that identifier for the purposes of attribution, it will no longer be there. Um, so, you know, certain things to drive that. Thanks. Thanks for the call out, Jeff. Is that any better? Yeah, that sounds better. Yeah. I'll let you, um, I'll let you yeah. the, the only thing to add there, uh, and Neil, thanks for the question, um, is that uh, we do the redirect. I would say at least 60% of the time uh, on the traffic that we see, uh, the times that we don't, um, just for the broader audience, uh, the times that we don't are for uh, self-attributing networks uh, that we uh, receive claim information from based on the events we send, and for the networks who send us uh, asynchronous clicks, either from the client or from the servers where they handle the redirects. Uh, but all of our smart link technology, as Ethan just mentioned, uh, is all based on receiving that user uh, and sending them via 302 to a final destination uh, based on the parameters set in the platform. So um, it is not an insignificant amount of clicks that we redirect. That's good to know. It's funny you got that knock around your brain up there, Mark. Impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, you know, unpacking another element of, you know, we kind of talked a little bit about this already. So we can jump through this slide pretty quick, but the, the notion of future proofing, this is a term, you know, I see a lot blog posts and guides, but um, you know, what does it look like a year from now, two years from now to start doing things today to future proof your ability to measure? Um, so I don't know if you want to quickly rip through these together, but obviously we've already talked about scam. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but um, feel free to comment to this. Yeah, you know, I, I think, one of the biggest things that I see, and I, I hit on it a little bit in the past slide, but um, you know, when we're looking at something like scan, MMM, incrementality, it really goes into the success of how you're structuring your campaigns and how you're able to orchestrate the campaign management going into flight to narrow somewhat the aperture of what you're seeing, still staying within privacy thresholds to ensure that you're receiving data but making sure that you can capitalize on a very broad campaign strategy to make sure that you can get various channel signals flowing through the system. So, you know, outside of what we've already hit on, I think, you know, just further double clicking on 
how you're managing campaigns, how you're standardizing campaign taxonomies across partners to the extent that you can, that'll really help identify some of the anonymous data that's coming in and making sure that you can understand the channel source. Yeah. And from my perspective, in addition to what we've already um, chatted about is uh, around context. Um, make sure that you're serving ads in context, even if they're brand ads, making sure that they're contextually relevant and there's uh, a semblance of performance associated with that delivery. And then the second is making sure that you're open to like new platforms. Uh, Vision Pro, for an example, uh, that's a pretty pretty intimate ad experience and uh, not quite sure what Apple will allow from an uh, ad exposure perspective, but uh, new platforms and new inventory uh, could be a little scary for creative teams or uh, UA teams, but uh, worth worth exploring for sure. I, I want to see an ad in Vision Pro. I do. <laughs> What do you think about all the streaming platforms that have, have launched ad supported offerings, right? Kind of the HVOD um, hybridized approach. I mean, I know all those all those uh, ad spots won't be VR maybe enabled out of the gate, but I wonder to what extent that'll rely on the creative versus what Vision Pro can do through AR. And yeah, I, I'm we have we have that slide coming up here, so we can unpack that further. Um, so I, I guess real quick from a from a Kochaba perspective to our clients or anybody working with an MMP in general, um, can you speak through just some of the things that um, marketers should be expecting or looking to be communicating with their MMPs on as the next, you know, basically six to 10 months un unfolds? Yeah, so, uh, you know, from my perspective, a lot of the, the privacy manifest work is going to be done by an MMP as it relates to their specific SDK. Um, for customers that aren't using our SDK, you know, understanding how you can manage the data, you know, what sources your your application is collecting, really getting good at coming up with the the privacy manifest as well as the private nutrition labels is something that you'll have to take on. We can help with that quite a bit through what we're you know planning it as a just rough out from what we know about private man the privacy manifest today, but. Um, you know, stay in touch with MMPs, really hyper focus on again the data collection catalogs. Um, expect changes with how domains are showing up within the apps. Again, I think that something that we can't really stress enough is there is going to start to be a separation of responsibility around what domains are managing what types of data. And that's fully to, you know, be able to, to ride within those data cat categories that are described by Apple. Um, and then, like it's called out here. Um, if you're not using SK Ad Network, start investing in it, understand what models you can generate, look at the signal traffic that you're getting and see what you can do to, to further uh, evolve those campaigns and um, MMPs obviously can, can really help there. Yeah, for sure. And would only add some guidance on how to interact with uh, us as your MMP partner is um, patience and faith. Uh, like, uh, please, please be patient with us. We may not have all the answers initially. Um, we are waiting for answers from Apple, just as you are, and we will build as fast as those answers come in, uh, and have faith and trust that we will make your lives as easy as possible. If you're using our SDK, uh, and, uh, insulate you from risk and exposure, just like we did when the ATT framework was introduced, uh, when we stopped doing probabilistic attribution out of, um, making sure we, uh, conserved our app developers' presence on the store. Um, wait for guidance, ask for help when needed uh, as it relates to tracking domain declaration uh, on, in Privacy Manifest, whether you want to opt in early, um, chat with us about what you're planning on, what options we have about domain creation, as Ethan just mentioned, um, how to be a collaborative process. And then as it relates to our SCAD network offering, um, if it is... Uh, if if it could support your application better, let us know the ways that it could. And we build and iterate on our SCAD models all the time. We just released all our, our all of our SCAD four tooling, um, so that feedback is welcome. Uh, as we know uh, what to build to best support your efforts with the tools that we do have access to. So, um, collaboration is is my my key takeaway there. That's good. That's good. I know. Um... 
I've, I've listened to a number of podcasts where just, you know, scan has been spoken about. It's just so difficult. And um, you, know, you talk to some will call it useless. So like, I can't get anything out of scan. I think the, the bottom line, right, is it's here to stay. And there are ways to probably do whatever you're doing today better if, if you feel like it's not working. Um, we, ha we have, uh, I guess the Cochaba Foundry team in-house has done like, we call them, they call them the scan consult um, or the bit protocol consult, but it's, you know, it's this fascinating analysis they can do against somebody's app, all the events that they're measuring, the frequency of events, the, you know, it's just, it's fascinating what they can come up with to then help guide somebody on a much better implementation of scan to get way more insight than they really thought was possible. So if it's something you're struggling with, um, definitely reach out. I will, as we jump to this next slide, I'm going to pick off uh, this next question real fast because it kind of harkens back to a couple slides ago. It's anonymous, but it says, what are the pros, cons of doing asynchronous click call versus redirect? And with the updates to click parameter tracking, would you encourage all ad partners to adapt to sending asynchronous click calls? I can start with that one, Ethan, or from a Go product perspective, or you can from a tech one. <laughs> Go for it. So from, from a product perspective, my, my guidance would be is whoever does the redirect, make sure that you trust their infrastructure and they offer all of the same tooling that a Cochava does with something like our smart linking technology. Uh, we can route the user based on a host of criteria and send them into the app in the form of a deep link. Those deep links can be dynamic. So all of our routing technology we've invested heavily in. So if you choose, if you, if, is open for discussion or up for debate of who you would like to handle your user redirects, just make sure you do research into that uh, because not all redirect providers are created equally. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think just to highlight some of the pros and cons, um, one of the biggest cons that we see uh, when they're not directly tied to um, our trackers are you, you do start to see some click delays coming from servers. And that's based on just timestamps that we see on when that data can be processed and shipped over versus when the user has interacted with the, the link directly. Um, so there's some timing characteristics to think through when you're thinking about client side redirects versus receiving uh, asynchronous clicks from um, your ad tech providers. Uh, outside of that, you know, everything that, that Mark said is, is true. Um, it, it's a lot of volume. There's a lot of, uh, you know, sensitivity on on where users land. If you're working with a, a partner and ensuring that that technology can stay up and that you don't land on a page that uh, is harmful to your consumers or your their uh, user journey into your app experience. So that's something to, to really be thinking about as you're selecting a partner. Um, and then, you know, with a lot of these changes, I think that uh, where we see the the interaction with the the actual click itself will help inform some of the downstream attribution that takes place, specifically as it relates to um, universal linking or deep linking technology and aligning that with MMPs versus other providers should help streamline some of the re-engagement signals or refer tracking that you're able to to do. Um, by directly integrating with those client side clicks, leveraging our our click technology. That was a good that was a good answer. Thank you, gents. Um, we'll see. Scan. We've already talked about a bit, so I guess we can bite off a, a little bit more of that apple real fast. Um, can you talk briefly just what we know from what was talked about on Scan from w, WDC? Yeah. Firstly. Um, thank goodness that there wasn't a huge departure from <laughs> SCAD4 <laughs> yeah. uh, because I just don't think the world was ready for that. Uh, so with the introduction of SCAD5, uh, and, and that could change, right? The, the documentation is always developing, but initially the biggest feature that is now available in uh, version 5 is re-engagement support. Uh, historically, SCAD network um, prior to version 5 was uh, the, the catalyst for measurement that you were uh, attributing against with Apple SCAD network was the install event or the reinstall event. Um, and uh, now Apple is uh, indicating that they're going to support like a purchase, for example, uh, with uh, relation to anonymized aggregated um, OS level measurement support, which is SCAD. Uh, so uh, that is exciting. Um, 
Ethan, any other thoughts on SCAT 5? I had a couple of general ecosystem concepts that I wanted to address, but. Yeah, not, not a whole bunch. I think that um, the only one that I would add is just double clicking on that support for the app open alongside of the install and the, the reinstall. And, um, you know, I think that the trend that we're seeing uh, with a lot of the SCAD rollout is um, MMPs are typically really pushing the, the roadmap for um, SKAD network that might, uh, you know, put the emphasis back on what we can do with some of their modeling too much. But we're already looking at, at ways with SCAD4 to make sure that app opens are eligible for some of the conversion signal as an example of that. So if re-engagement is really something that you want to see through your SCAD campaign, it's not a wait for SKAD network, uh, you know, five. It's really work with your, your model service to make sure that you can set up the, the actual actions that are um, really important for you to drive engagement. There's certainly sensitivity around the, the conversion windows and how they stay open, but a lot of those limitations were, um, you know, really refactored and, and improved with uh, Scan4. Yeah, for sure. And the only addition that I'd have uh, on the SCAD Piper engagement edition uh, would be is it calls into question the future viability or what Apple has planned for deep linking. Uh, yep. So if uh, deep linking is, it, it, this could be considered an indication that uh, the deep linking uh, process could be taken at the OS level. I don't think iOS users based on their universal link introduction years ago, I don't think they have any intention of taking that from app developers, but they may take it from third party uh, app developers and they may handle it at the OS level. So um, it'll be interesting to see what plays out here, uh, but wanted to call out that commentary in market that we'll just have to keep an eye on and uh, we'll see what it uh, what it results in. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, if you think about just the notion of the attribution windows of scan that are not configurable, right, individually by the client or campaign, I'm, I'm curious how Apple will define those from a re-engagement standpoint, um, different from acquisition. Um, I agree. You said, you said you had a couple of the larger ecosystem things, Mark. Did you want to unpack that against Scan, or was the probably the only other item in, in addition to the one I um, just brought up was the um, did want to call out that Apple from a from a re-engagement perspective, Apple does specify a re-download both within their ad services API where we get the Apple search ads data uh, and from the SCAD payloads that they uh, forward to the ad network in the conversion data. So the re-download metric is something we get today. Um, so it's not really related to the SCAD 5 introduction. I've seen a little bit of that commentary in market. So just wanted to clarify that we've had access to re-downloads for uh, years. Mm -hmm. That's a good call out, yeah. Well, lastly, Vision Pro, and maybe come, I don't know, whenever this comes out and I get one, maybe we'll do future webinars in Vision Pro. And <laughs> the, lake, the lake in the background can be a real thing that everybody can experience. Right. Um, well, yeah, so I, you know, just through this in here, it's kind of a fun topic for the end. We're coming down in the last five minutes. Um, what are your thoughts on Vision Pro? I, I'm super excited. Like I mentioned, uh, in, a, in a past life, I worked very heavily in um, AR and VR and, and image processing and um, the technology is near and dear to my heart and uh, the development experience and the fun that it is to develop these types of applications. So, you know, I, I think that from a consumer standpoint, um, we've seen a lot of different trends in AR and VR and is Vision Pro the, the be all end all? Probably not. Um, but I, I like the refinement that we've seen within VR over the last call it 10, 15 years where um, going back to when the Oculus was first announced, you know, it was groundbreaking, but you were looking through a screen door. And if anyone's been a long time Oculus user, you'll know what I, I mean by that. Seeing what, how the technology's progressed in, in relatively a fairly short time window, super impressive. And, you know, as it relates to uh, the marketing side, really interested to see Mark hit on this earlier and, and sort of you, Jeff, on um, just how the ad experience and the consumer engagement will be driven seeing if we can, you know, take trends from the the in-game advertisement ecosystem, which has existed for some time around how we're blending these digital experiences with physical experiences, I think is really, really appealing. Um, and I'm excited. I'm excited to see what the development kit looks like and uh, definitely want to get my hands on them. 
yeah, my my excitement is very similar veins in that I'm a bit of a goggle skeptic, uh, but the technology is impressive. There's no getting around it. Uh, so I am uh, I'm most interested probably to see how the technology evolves into something uh, that you would be willing to walk around public wearing. Yeah. I, noticed, I noticed the eyesight feature, I, and I, I had to watch the, the Vision Pro segment in, in bits and pieces. Um, so maybe they did have this, but I know they have the part with the eyesight feature where if somebody comes into view, they'll actually pierce the veil of the, of the um, you know, whatever your environment you're in. But I'm, I'm curious, I, I have to admit that I, I have watched Fail Army on YouTube on plenty of occasions, and the count of times that it's somebody with VR goggles like running into their own TV or right into a wall or into another person um, is countless. And so I just, I wonder if they'll, there's a notion of the eyesight function also like, hey, okay, wall, uh, yep. not just individual human beings that are coming into view. I'm sure they'll, I'm sure they'll figure it out. Um, yeah, with all the, all the cameras that I have a feeling you're going to start to get really used to the uh, proximity sensors that your car has. Uh, just, you know, little, little warnings on depth would be, uh, pretty fun. Yeah. Well, and then just from, you know, uh, you know, I know Kochava, right, historically started out as an MMP. Um, mobile apps was the the heritage that was uh, kind of the start. And uh, now kind of truly, you know, thinking omni-channel um, in the present day, I think this is just an exciting new channel that, you know, we're excited to help our customers measure. And I know well, the iOS SDKs we have may already be able to measure this, so we'll make sure we have measurement from day one. Um, Here's a question that just popped in. Um, I think we have time for sort. So does advertisement opportunities significantly change for mixed reality with the rollout of the Vision Pro, or will it take further iteration on the product and tech before that becomes possible? Either of you want to take that future yeah, cast? I think, I think day one, uh, engagement with consumers gets gets a lot, uh, lot more appealing. And, you know, again, you can just think of, of things even in the um, physical goods space on, uh, you know, like eat, going out and trying on outfits and seeing how that converts into, um, you know, an actual payment and the the physical world. And I think there there's certainly going to need to be evolution in tech along the way. But day one, the ability to really have an immersive ad experience is already there with the with the technology. So even as you're thinking through, like. Um, you know, how does this work with a video stream? You mentioned uh, that was announced during the uh, the event that D plus is going to be launching directly with Vision Pro, have support for it. You know, that type of an immersive experience with, you know, potentially an, an AVOD or an ad supported experience as well alongside of it is very, very impactful um, from, a, from a focus standpoint that the consumer can have and the immersive um, nature that they have with your brand. So. Um, I, I think that it's a little bit of a, a, not necessarily a wait and see, it will have impact on consumers. The technology will need to advance to really take full benefit of the experience. And I'm hoping that we, we continue to see a trend, um, away from just VR into AR. And that's where, you know, I think we get a really, really powerful blend between the, the digital and physical experience between, between advertisements and, and consumers. Yeah. Didn't you call that fidgetal, Jeff? <laughs> it's a, it's a real word. It exists. Uh, it, I love it. Yep. Blending the physical and the digital together. I just, yeah, I think about Amazon and shopping and being able to like put it on and then like see a couch. I know they already have some AR related stuff where you can use your camera and try to like position it and see what it might look like, but the ability to have it be three-dimensional and like put furniture in your room and try it out before. Yeah. Pretty fascinating. Well, we are at time. Um, I want to thank you, Ethan, Mark, for jumping on. I know WWDC was very fresh and uh, it's not even really a week old, uh, but here we are. So thanks for jumping in and uh, just coming to the mat and discussing all things that are changing. So, and thanks to the audience for attending and uh, have a great rest of your day. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Appreciate it. Bye.